Welcome back, l l ladies and g gentlemen. You are l l listening to the Whatnots Review Show, uh, where each week we have a different story to talk about. We cover all sorts of different mediums, different genres, it's like our little book club style podcast here. Uh, this week, we are going to be talking about the fifth element. It's a classic sci-fi film and the second week in our Shame Timber series, <laughs> yep. uh, which we will mention more about in just a sec. Uh, my name is Kyle Springer. I am joined, as always, by Melissa Wilkinson. Yep, it's me. Yeah, it, it is you. You have not changed. You're, you're, you know, you know, you're not some no. robot or... <laughs> I bought a new pillow, uh, a new decorative pillow for my bed that you can yeah. see. This is the only change in my life. <laughs> change is a good thing sometimes. Mm. <laughs> it's good. Uh, how how was, you, how was your weekend, Ben? Because I, I, I talked to you last Friday for the captain's mm. log, but what have you been up to, up to this weekend? Uh, I went on a drive-in adventure last night. I drove uh, out into Illinois, an entire state away, to go to oh, a drive-in theater. I did not realize it was a whole state away. Well, it's only 45 minutes, uh, I guess, I guess but, but it still. is across state lines. Yeah, that makes it seem like such a big journey. Yeah. Adventure. So you went and saw Tenet, because that's, that's what yep. you had said. I guess yeah. it was a Tenet double teacher with that and uh the J J jackie robinson <laughs> biopic yeah which i i this is the park of the drive-in is that they still schedule everything like it's olden times and by olden times i mean like i don't know 1968 like it's 10 bucks to get in you see the move everything's a double feature Right, you know, yeah, they didn't yeah. have another new movie to play with tenets. They're like, we're just playing you a movie from several years ago. It's free. Stay if you want. But it was already like 10, 30, almost 11 by the time Tenet ended. And I'm like, I can't stay here. <laughs> I can't not get home until like 1 a.m. I have nice. to go home. So in a sentence or two, was Tenet good? Am I missing out by not saying hey, um, it yet? <laughs> no, I'm saying it's good, but it isn't like, oh, it's a lot. no, you have to like hazmat suit up and go to a theater or like make your roommate drive you to wherever your nearest particular drive in may be, right, yeah. even if that's three states away. It's good. It's solid. I'm glad good. I went. It was a movie. Okay, I'll good. say that it is much easier to understand than Primer. Oh. We've already okay. watched Primer, so we are, like, set up for Tenet. Tenet speaks an easier language. Okay, good to know. Because, yeah, the only uh, 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 other review that I've heard from someone in a Discord uh, d d d d in a Discord server that I'm in was just like, it's a lot. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> very your, much. Yeah. So, and good. I was good. just distracted by the fact that it is a movie. Oh, boy, I get to see a movie again. Jack came out and met me. This is oh, the first nice. time I'd seen Jack in person in like over six months. Her and her mom are parked in their car next to me. That's fun. So I'm like, oh boy, I had to see a movie. I had to, Shout to out see to a friend. Jack. Shout out to Jack. I'm just sitting in my car eating Twizzlers. I'm real happy. So the movie was kind of a blur. Like Elizabeth Debicki was very good and very tall. Okay. Good stuff. <laughs> I started watching Deadwood. Uh, this weekend, I'm like, se I've watched the first seven <laughs> episodes now. You, these, you always watch shows that I feel like pitching, like way before I ever get there. And then I'm like, oh, dang, Kyle already it's, watched that. Like, well, that's the thing. Because like now it's like, oh, it's only 12 episodes. We can hear that at some point. So, yeah, you, mm -hmm. you might see Deadwood here on the show at some point down the road. I hope so. It's yeah. been on my to watch list for a long time. Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it so far. So far, so good. Uh, Good. I, I I was hoping they would be a little bit more creative in their cursing and stuff like that. It, it is still fun to watch them <laughs> do that, but that was like the one thing that I, that I heard. It's like, oh, they cuss so much in, in that show, and they do. I yep. was just hoping for a little bit more variety, but good stuff. Uh, <laughs> let's get to what we were uh, what we're supposed to be t talking about. Shame Timber, yep. the fifth 
element. I am a huge sci-fi fan. I like time travel stories. I like cyberpunk stories, all of that kind of stuff. I've never seen the fifth element until now. This has been on my list of shame for a long, long time. Because, uh, yeah, I, I, I knew this was like a classic sci-fi film. This is one of the ones you had to have seen if you mm. call yourself a sci-fi fa- fan. And I was always just like, yeah, that, that, that one, you know, with <laughs> Bruce Willis. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I haven't seen the first four elements. Do <laughs> right, I need yeah. to catch up first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, 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 is this some weird offshoot of... <laughs> Avatar, Who knows? but yeah, it's good. So I I have finally mm. seen this film, but that's kind of been my history with the film. I I had seen it, I'd seen pictures, I'd seen gifs, I'd seen things on line. So I I think I did a good job of avoiding spoilers and stuff because I really had no idea what this movie was all about. Um. Yeah, I was I was like, oh, I was kind of not expecting half of this stuff, so it was good. It was oh, good. neat. Uh, had 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 you seen this before? Yeah, I was. I've seen it only once before this. I watched okay. it a couple years ago. It's one of my brother James's favorite movies. He's got all the little uh, pop figurines for this. Like he's not a, he's not a pop guy. Yeah, he's not a pop guy, but he's like, I want those ones. This particular set, I want my my Corbin and my Lilu and my Ruby and my Jean Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg all in yeah. a nice little line. <laughs> so I knew their Good faces, stuff. and then I watched the movie. And Good I stuff. I got to okay. tell you, I went through an ordeal to see this film. <laughs> oh no! What? So you 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 kind of mentioned a little bit about what happened yes. in our Discord. Okay. But what's the story so, here? So I borrowed, uh, it wasn't streaming anywhere for free. I didn't mm-hmm. feel like paying the five bucks to rent it somewhere. So I borrowed Jams' Blu-ray copy of it. And it's Friday night. I'm like sitting down to watch this movie. And the, the Blu-ray just doesn't work. Like my player's not reading it over and over again. I unplug the thing. I restart it. I put other discs in there. Those it, other discs work. Was it like a r- r- region locked thing? No, I don't think so. It was just like a regular steel book like you'd get at Best Buy. And like it didn't tell me anything. It just said, uh, can't can't load the disc. I tried like five times, couldn't load the disc. We need the other four elements. (laughs) Right. The player insists I go through this chronologically. I have to watch all of Avatar first. (laughs) So then the next day my mom drops off their old Blu-ray player, because they just upgraded it and the old one still works fine. Okay. And she forgot to bring the remote. (laughs) And I thought, that's okay. Well, there's like a couple buttons on it. Maybe just hitting the play button on the box will work. And it wasn't working. And I'm like, great. Now I have to drive to my parents' house, pick up the old remote, or pay the five bucks, which I did not want to do for a movie I had on Blu-ray there in my hands. Yeah. So I think I, I texted you and I'm like, I might have to postpone this until later tomorrow, which we ended up doing anyway. Like I, Not I for the same to, r- to try, reason, but time still. to drive to, drive to North County and get this remote. And then finally I asked my roommate, who I has been saying on and off for months, I think I'm going to sell my Blu-ray player. I don't know if I want to keep it. I don't really watch it. I think I'm going to sell it. And I forgot where she was with that, and I was like mm-hmm. 90% sure she had sold it. So finally I asked her, and she's like, oh, yeah, I never got around to it. It's like, what do you have, a Sony? I have a Sony. So I was just able to borrow her remote, oh, finally, nice. and Perfect. watch the Tang movie. That worked out perfectly, then. <laughs> Why was this hard? <laughs> you made it, though. I did. I, I watched it yesterday afternoon. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, so your second time watching it, mm. uh, what, what, what were your thoughts I, I was able to pay closer attention to it this time. Last time, like we watched it with friends, it was right. it was Christmas. Like we had uh, family Christmas, and then family Christmas was over by like four o'clock. And a friend came over, and we all watched a movie together. And I was like full of Christmas that food. Christmas and I was classic. The fifth and, yeah. element. <laughs> I don't know. I think we did a double feature. I think we watched that and Blade Runner. 
We okay. might watch Blade Runner first, so I was tired and I was just Another full of Another like, Christmas classic. <laughs> <laughs> I was sleepy. <laughs> oh, well, after you've already opened presents, like you don't feel like watching Christmas movies anymore. It's like, I've done it. I did, is what, over. What, what else do I have to get psyched for? I did it. Now I need to get psyched about the future. <laughs> <laughs> Where yeah. there's a, a McDonald's true, true. Okay. I can go okay. through with my pilot car that floats okay. around. Good stuff. So mm. yeah, I, I, I thought I, my initial reaction was okay. Man, this is boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, like now that I've had some time to sit on it and chew on it, I think I. I, I ended up liking it. It but it's 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 a it's a weird movie because <laughs> it like in terms of the plot it's really simple like that there's not much to it um mm. like it it it's it, it's a good '90s action flick like there's not much more to it besides that but it's it's just a spectacle. T- to watch like there's mm-hmm. there's just weird characters and weird and strange things happening they all have these like crazy costumes and stuff and just like there's, there's so many like contradictions within this and yeah it's like this is actually kind of interesting now that i think <laughs> about it huh. okay. yeah i, 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 I can think... see why people like this yeah the movie has some really interesting, very exciting sequences in it. And then a handful of other sequences that are sort of like exposition uh-huh. and like, you know, military dudes having tense conversations with each other. And you're like, okay, okay now I see it might have not just been the Christmas ham that made me <laughs> gloss over the first time I tried to watch this movie. Yeah, but like the chunks when it's like really exciting, it's very exciting and yeah. stylistically always a delight to watch. I really dug the Absolutely. music yeah. in this movie too. It's got a lot going on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. So yeah, I I, I think I end, ended up liking this this film, but initial stuff was just like I don't know. Maybe it was a little bit overhyped. Who knows? And and the the film does start out very different than what you think it's oh, going oh, to be. Yeah, did not expect Ever, that start. I think the images everybody knows from this movie are like just the futuristic outfits and like hairstyles for all the characters all the and this people futuristic city. Lilu. Yeah, like the city it takes place on like a future New York with all these flying cars. It looks like the future New York from Futurama. Yeah. If you've mm-hmm. ever seen the opening of Futurama, it's just that. But French, I guess. <laughs> Futurama. Like, yeah. <laughs> Le Futurama. <laughs> and um, it's like, that's what you've pictured for this fun, futuristic sci-fi adventure. But the movie starts in like uh-huh. uh, <laughs> the early 20th century. It starts like the mummy. There's a guy it's, like, yeah, it's like an Indiana Jones. And like, yeah, brushing dirt off Biblical. of the hieroglyphs. And then the late Luke Perry is there trying in a journal. Yeah. Which I, I did not recognize him at first. And then I saw his name in the credits. I was like, Luke Perry was in this. He's a little I, boy. I, I, I think I, I would have recognized him. And I l- 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 looked him up. And I was like, man, I didn't recognize him at all. He's not totally evolved in a hunk yet. He's just sort of like um like a grad school dweeb. As, as sure. dweeby as Luke Perry ever could have been. Sure. Right. <laughs> so it looks like you're just watching something, yeah, like The Mummy or an Indiana Jones or whatever, that type of movie. And then, like, they turn, like, they hit the wrong stone in the pyramid. Like, they turn a key, like, they discover the wrong hieroglyph, something like that. And then all these big, scary, weird alien dudes come walking in. It's like, oh, okay, this is where the movie really starts. Yeah. And then there's a big t- time j- 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 jump and stuff. 300 like that, so. years later. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, no more Luke Perry. He's, he's only in the prologue. He doesn't yeah. uh, return in the 300 years in the future, eating at a future McDonald's. But yeah, so let's do a synopsis uh, for p- 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 people who, like me, may mm. not have seen the film. Uh, and then we'll get into housekeeping and spoilers after that. So, 
yeah so it like like we said it starts kind of i feel like saying ancient times but i don't know if that's exactly the right word <laughs> ancient 300... times we mean like 1924 sure yeah right <laughs> but uh, they're in an ancient building yeah and they're in ancient egypt or something Uh like that yeah it just has this real like indiana jones vibe to it uh kind of biblical as as well um and yeah they are studying these these hieroglyphics and it's kind of depicting this this tale or the story of the Egyptians bowing down to these godlike figures, and they don't really know what they are, uh, and that there are these four elements that kind of appease them, or 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 like uh, something. You're not exactly sure, but they're you know they're yeah. like there's four of these things, and then as they're studying it more and more, they finally realize that there is a fifth one that they didn't know about yet in the midst of all of that that's when these aliens come and they're like in like a hundred years or so you guys are about to be destroyed so you need to protect these things and wait for the time you know and we will be back and we will save you and Stuff like that. And that's when we get that time jump 300 years in the future. Earth is still here. We have flying cars. We still have McDonald's. Uh, yep. <laughs> the McDonald's is very important to me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. And, and that, I, I guess they recovered a piece of this alien. Is that what it was? The one that got like got stuck in the pyramid? I, I was a little yeah. bit unclear on that but they they recover this like body part of one of Mm. these like ancient alien beings and are like hey we have the technology to now kind of clone this or like make this new being yeah like see what this being originally was like we've got like a foot bone we can make the whole thing now with a 3d printer right yeah uh so that's what they do, and they end up making Mila Jojovich. So mm. that's how she got her her start. <laughs> is this uh, her first film? Actually, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's her first film, but uh, she she is what appears in 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 this thing. Uh, she has no idea where she is or how to speak. Uh, she speaks this weird a- alien thing, and she goes on the run. Uh, they are trying to track her down, and she ends up in the taxi cab of one Bruce Willis playing Corbin Dallas. Um, and he's he's just kind of a Joe Schmo. He's a regular John McClane, you know. Well, not exact. Well, I guess kind of like a John McClane. Because <laughs> it wasn't John McClane like a decorated soldier or he, special he, he forces was agent or something. He was a cop. He was just a regular okay. co- cop. In this, he's not okay. a cop, but he's still just that well, regular he, guy. He was he was an extremely decorated special forces agent. I think he got too caught up with the with the work. His wife left him. He's like, I gotta leave the work. I gotta get a fresh start in life. I'm gonna drive a cab. So he's just driving a cab around, and it seems to not be going well. Yeah. Yeah, and so then he ends up with this runaway, uh, and she's asking for his help, and he decides to help her, and that's how he gets roped into this Mm. adventure, starts running from the cops, ends up taking her to this priest, and that's when he kind of finds out about these aliens and the end of the earth, and he, yeah, he just starts getting mixed up in, in this big galactic adventure uh and ends up having to save the world Mm. so there you go does does that about sum it up in 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 terms of summary plot synopsis that's a good start i feel okay (laughs) yeah i feel like if somebody's hung on with us long enough they already know what the plot of the movie is there you go uh so i'm looking at mila jojovich's wikipedia page uh her debut professional film role as samantha de in the romantic thriller two moon junction 
It was in 1988. Wow. An American erotic thriller romance. Ooh. Go. She's also in Zoolander, which I coincidentally watched earlier this week. <laughs> so, I've seen Z- 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 Zoolander. I don't know if I've I knew that she was in that too. I she's, only know um, her from Resident Evil. She's that uh, tough lady who's on uh, Mugatu's team. She's kind of the enforcer, I, right? It's been so long since I've seen Zoolander, so I have no idea. Well, I'm now I'm questioning myself. Let's see. Control F. Was she in? Does it the film? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Zoolander. That yeah. is her. That is her. What an incredibly specific actress to wander into watching twice this week. There you go. Good stuff. Um, yeah. That about wraps us up for the summary. Let's mm-hmm. get into some housekeeping, and then we will move on to spoilers and such. Uh, mm. if, you, if you guys did not know, we have multiple podcasts here at The Whatnots. Uh, you guys can find out more information on our website, thewhatnots.com, uh, or your favorite podcasting platform of choice. One of those podcasts is Crossplay, uh, which is our video g- 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 game podcast uh, that we've been doing for 40-something e- 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 episodes oh, now. Back. Yeah, uh, but we just brought on two new hosts to help out with that. So we have a four-man c- crew on that that have joined the Whatnots, uh, and we all had our, our, our first uh, podcast with all, 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 all of us uh, just nice. yesterday. So be on the lookout for that one as well. That was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, hopefully maybe one day we'll get them on the review show here. We'll have them on the captain's log and stuff like that. So uh, be on the lookout for all of that stuff. But if you like what we do, patreon.com slash the whatnots is where you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. Uh we have a three dollar tier which has all kinds of exclusive content mm-hmm. which you can check out uh and we would also like to give a big shout out to our patreon supporters at the five dollar tier so thank you sam for helping us out and supporting us uh you mean a lot to us so thank you thank, thank you, you. So mm-hmm. okay i guess that means it is time for spoilers all right here we go Let's dive mm-hmm. in. Um, I, th- I think the first thing that I kind of want to t- talk about is the, the this idea of contradictions in the film. I, I think that's what I'm kind of starting to notice in, okay. in, in, in this film as, as I think about it more. Because, um, yeah, all of the stuff I had heard about this film or, like, why people liked the, the, this film was like the fashion and the the, the style and the way yeah. things look and that c- c- kind of goes to imply that there is um what's the right word for this there uh i don't know like in 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 sci-fi you you have like two extremes right you have the really okay. glossy yeah. smooth like stark white walls and high fashion oh, and yes. stuff like that. I was expecting more of that. But mm, okay. this took the route that is more cramped and dirty and things mm. seem lived in and they have the same car for 20-something years and that's it, right? Like, that's their life. Like, he gets in that ca- that cab and it looks like there is just no space in, in that cab. <laughs> he goes home, 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 and his apartment is the size of the room that I that I'm in, like right right now. There, like, there's no yeah. room, and I like that. But I I guess I didn't really realize that was in there. Um, I think that's just one of the like at the the like surface level. Like here was what I was expecting based on what I was t- told. And here's what I got in in instead, right? Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, for a movie that is heralded for such innovative styling, the a lot of the settings you're in, a lot of the like props that it uses are really clunky and old. 
Yeah. Like the car, like the cars, yeah, they're Which flying is not a bad around, thing. but the yeah, like the cars are flying around, but they've got the body style of like an old Studebaker, like they're boats, like they're huge yeah. clunky things. Like uh, Corbin Dallas has this tiny little efficiency apartment. He's always taking phone calls. Mm-hmm. Like I, that's something I realized. Like there's no uh, video phones. This isn't a movie with any holograms in it. Like it's not that kind of a future. It's like his mom still calls him on the phone to complain about classic mom things, but it's just that she lives on the you moon and she's talking to him. <laughs> she's calling him <laughs> while he's flying a car around. Right. Yeah. 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 Like it's it's that stuff. I think we we for for sci-fi films too sci-fi is all is often like speculative fiction it's more philosophical it's mm-hmm. it's uh making yeah. you question uh philosophical things or moral conundrums or like giving words of warning to like hey if we keep going down this p- p- path you know here's here's what's gonna happen this is almost not that it it is more fantasy in 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 mm-hmm. that sense and i think it's also more of an action film than a lot of yes. sci-fi films tend to, to be at the same time you also don't see sci-fi films be you're, you're not you don't see them often be comedic because again they're <laughs> v- v- very pensive and it's like hmm aliens <laughs> are robots people too <laughs> what, what is gonna happen if we invent yeah. time travel oh yeah no. this is right? much closer to a, a star wars than it is to like a 2001 but even star like star, star wars has some comedic moments but i wouldn't say yeah. it's a comedy no Maybe the more recent ones have some more comedic stuff but like I I really wouldn't describe that as a comedy. I think this ha- like I I still w- 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 wouldn't necessarily describe this as a comedy, but I think this is closer to that. Than yeah, the comedy Star might War. be like the third or fourth genre label that a streaming service puts on this movie. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, j- just like n- not even comedy in like hey funny joke but um but just like <laughs> the the absurdity of stuff yes yes like there there are just some absurd things that happen uh like chris chris tucker in his outfit and his like that really is just absurd uh right. <laughs> the whole the whole thing of, about uh uh, what's his name? Uh, I'm Corbin Dallas. I'm ch- I'm checking in to my flight. Right. I won yes. the lottery. <laughs> it's like you're the third person to do. It's like, like right. I do kind of wish. Like, I loved the sequence in this movie. So Corbin's apartment. He has this like kind of Murphy bed that like slides in and out from the wall. Yeah. And like when he's done, when he wakes up in the morning, the bed slides back, like the mattress gets like pulled up and a new mattress and entirely new bed sheets and everything is Plastic laid in place. On. Yeah. yeah. It's like, um, like in a bowling alley, just replacing the pins. Like right, that's yeah. what his apartment does. And like, he's got this fridge. And then, like, that fridge, like, slides down, and then on top of that is, like, a sink and a washing machine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a, this cramped, it's like a tiny house, but the sci-fi metropolitan version of a tiny house, where mm-hmm. everything's something else, everything moves, you spin it, it turns, it goes up a level, down a level, it's something else. And these... Uh, space officers of some kind are coming to him saying like, we need you on this mission. You were our most decorated special forces agent. We know you're retired. Please. You have to help us with this mission. And then somebody else knocks on the, no, Lilu comes and knocks on the door and he's like, I don't want her to see me with you guys. So he shoves all of them in his fridge yeah. and then like the fridge like goes, goes down, down, it descends and it gets replaced by like the washing machine or whatever. <laughs> so just the comedy of, yeah, I can shove all three of you adults in my fridge. Uh, you're going to disappear. <laughs> I'm just going to shove you down into the walls and then you, I'm, I'm going to pull you out at the end of the movie and you're all going to be frozen. Like he shoves Ian Holm into his bed. And then at the end of the scene, you hear muffled screaming. He's underneath they, the new thing. Yeah. Right. He's been layered in plastic. <laughs> I want that 
to be an entire extended sequence in another movie. Like, it's good here, but I want more of this. Right. I want an entire comedy movie set in this version of New York City in this time where I get, like, the comedy of errors version of that entire scene, and it goes on for, like, 20 minutes, and it's a real set piece. I, I think this would be a ripe property for ex- expansion sometimes yeah. not, not necessarily sequels I, I i don't know if you necessarily need mm. to t- touch the, 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 this mm. but yeah just like something set in the in in the world of the fifth element um yeah i just want to see to see i just want to like i it's not it's less the characters. I want to see this setting again. Yeah. So I I, I think it's worth mentioning because we haven't mentioned it yet. Uh, this f- f- film was directed by Luc Besson uh, with the screenplay also written by him as well as uh, Robert Mark Common. Um, this was a story that Luc Besson started creating when he was like 16. Aww. Uh, and I, I, I guess he had seen... St- Star Wars around that same time, and he was wanting to make a, just, I, I guess, like a sci-fi fantasy a- a- epic uh, of his own, but couldn't make one until he made this. Um, but, but yeah, then we, we we've mentioned the fashion, and all of the costume d- design was by Jean Paul Jean Paul Gaudier. Uh, and then a lot of like the art direction and the set stuff is made by Mobius and Jean Claude yeah. uh, Mezieres. I'm not sure how to say his mm. his name there, but uh, you guys might know their work from comics and stuff like that. I know Mobius's work, um, and yeah, they do a lot of sci-fi stuff, and I think you can really see that in the art direction of this film and it's just like it's it's beautiful stuff um despite it also being like small and cramped and it's just it's yeah it's fascinating to to see this stuff in real life and not on a comic book page because that's also exactly what it looks like too it looks Mm -hmm. like a comic um so yeah, it, it's just it's something that I want to see more uh, 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 of down the road if they can explore that somehow, some way. Yeah, when you mentioned it looking like a comic, I was reminded of that panel or page, however big it is, in Scott Pilgrim, where it labels everything in Scott and Wallace's apartment. Sure, yeah. Like, I want that same panel. Just tell me what everything in Corbin's apartment does. <laughs> yeah, like, I, 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 I like the, that stuff. Like, that. that's a, another thing that sci-fi films often do is focus on, like, the consumerism and these big corporations and mm-hmm. these fancy gadgets and things like that. And this doesn't like it has that stuff in there like like you said like we're kind of fascinated by this like this like bowling pin style make your yeah. bed thing like that's an interesting thing but it, it has nothing to do with the film right <laughs> like it's just it's just like oh that's neat okay yeah just and this show me more you know i feel like this is reflective of the tone of the movie because you were talking about sci-fi as a series of like cautionary tales and warnings and like pensive thoughts about the future this is a world that isn't a utopia and also isn't a dystopia we don't get the sense that there's any specific looming world issues at hand like there doesn't seem like there's a larger problem outside of anything than what's immediately happening they're very to well our particular pro- it's just not yeah. a part of you know this fiction here so yeah and it I don't know if I can name another property quite like that, where it is just this straightforward, simple, it's a world, it's a future. And, you know, (laughs) there aren't cities on fire, and there's also not, like, a robot butler who solves all your problems. It's just, like, right down the middle, plain old life. I'm thinking of, like, a modern-day trailer for this film, and you know how they they do that, like... (laughs) 
in a world where and then they like say something like where yeah. slavery is blah 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 you know it's yeah, like yeah yeah the, the, this would just stop there in the world yeah <laughs> it's a <laughs> like, world yeah in a world <laughs> yeah, it's like in a world where cars fly mcdonald's still exists one right. man must save the world right like the mcdonald's still existing doesn't seem to be any kind of a a commentary on it it's Not just yeah. we still have mcdonald's <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> good stuff mm -hmm. okay uh characters what, what, did you have a favorite character that you wanted to talk about Cause there there are some characters in this film and i mean that there in are. More than one way uh, i need to talk about all four leads where okay. do you want to start i need to tell you a story pick, regarding jean baptiste emmanuel's org pick your poison let's start with that one then <laughs> Okay, all right. So Jean Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg is the villain of this movie, played by Gary Oldman. And yep. every time I forget that he's doing a Southern accent, I'm I'm shocked. Like yeah, I said, I've seen I, this movie I was not before. expecting that at all. I didn't remember the plot, but I should have remembered that. No, it was an absolute shock again when he starts talking. It's wild. Yeah, I I what did not expect choice. that. What a weird performance he's doing. I was watching him, and I also swear he's blinking less than a normal person. Like, Gary Oldman is giving it his all. He probably is. Like that's, that's he's giving it probably... his all to make this role just unsettling. I, someone out there, please count the number of times Gary Oldman blinks in all of his I tried films. To do a scaring, I tried to do a staring contest with him, and like I blinked more than he did. Which might be like an actor's training. I don't know if they teach you that in acting school, how to just blink less. Because maybe it's distract. I, I, I don't know. Or maybe this is like a private personal skill of Gary Oldman. Like he goes so to I, parties and he's I, like, watch me not blink. <laughs> so I, 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 I have this book that's on my bookshelf back here. It's, it has a bunch of info g g g g g g g graphics. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all based on comics and, and stuff. Like the percentage mm -hmm. of... Uh, like superheroes with red in their costume versus blue, oh. blue and stuff like that. Um, it has a, a list of like within the first like however many issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Here's all the pizza t toppings that they they, they got, and it's just it, I'm yeah, it's, about it's that. just it's a bunch of like fun inf information. I feel like they could make. They're like another version of that book, but just like all like weird facts that Gary Oldman did to get into his <laughs> roles. Like, here's the number of times that he blinked in the I fifth need it for just all like real strong method actors. Like, give right? me just yeah. like an educational poster of weird stuff Daniel Day Lewis has done. <laughs> Great. So funny. Okay. So in this movie, Jean Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg. I think he only says his full name once, and most of the mm -hmm. time they just call him Zorg. But I have to use the full name. Which he's how got come this... that name is so popular in sci-fi? You get like Z Z Z Z Z Z Zerg oh. in Toy Story. That's also in uh, some video game like Warcraft or something. Uh, and yeah, now we have Zorg here. Just off by one letter. There. Yeah. Well, there was there was a an early computer game named Zork. Maybe these are just all spin-offs of Zork. Xenon of the 21st century or whatever that show was, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of our finest decobs. So Gary Oldman's hair. So he's got <laughs> He uses black hair and he has it like shaved down to like a patch in the middle of his head and it's long and it's like all swept over to one side. It's and then mohawk, he's wearing but, 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 but it's not like spiked up and gel. It's just like Yeah, it's laying and side. it's also a mohawk that's just like a pat, like an oval on top of his head. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like the sides are cut down or it's long on top. It's just like here's one oval on the top of my head Rest and all bald. of those hairs are like five inches long and he's also wearing like a weird plastic headpiece around it with a hole in it that his hair flips over which i kind of like so, 
So several years ago, I had just started working in the department I'm working now. Like I didn't hardly know anybody yet. And we were in a different office where we had like legit cubicles. So we didn't get to know each other very well. Like I'm kind of walled off from everybody else. We're all separated. And one of my coworkers, he come and I didn't know much about this guy. He's sort of like a quiet, chill, unassuming guy. He comes in one day with that haircut. Oh, God. And I didn't, like, I didn't know how to ask him about it. And I didn't recognize it immediately. It so, wasn't until, like, months. What <laughs> happened there, buddy boy? <laughs> I could have sworn him. Like, my guess at the time was, did you lose a bet? <laughs> he comes in with this haircut. <laughs> it's immediately so weird. And he's just, like, a nor- he's wearing, like, uh, like, like cargo pants and like a, a polo shirt, just like normal. He's just like a normal, quiet, unassuming guy, right? Mm-hmm. He just comes in with that, doesn't say a word. Nobody's talking about it. I want to ask about it, but like, I don't know this guy. I don't know how to say, hey, Justin, I uh, I finished those journal reports for you. Also, what's that? Uh, can you walk me through the choice you made here? Yeah. And it's not until like months later that I realized that's what his haircut was. It's the bad guy from the fifth element. <laughs> that's funny. So, <laughs> that is one of that. It, that was a pivotal. That was a pivotal turning point in my adult life. The mm-hmm. day he came in to work with that haircut, because it told me like all rules are off. What you think adult life is, it isn't. A guy can just walk in with that haircut and nothing changes. Life goes on. You can do what you want. Dustin could have the bad guy from the fifth element haircut. And like as office life goes on, I get to know the guy better. And I ask him one day, like, what was up with that haircut? And then he said, oh, I don't remember that. What? No. Did did he not remember? He didn't remember. And then it took him a minute. And he's like, oh, yeah, I I was trying to learn to cut my own hair. Oh, God. How do you not remember a haircut like that, man? And he's done it again. That haircut is shit. Like he, so he let it grow out. He let it grow out too too long. He like shaved his head again. He had the Gary Oldman haircut again. He's had a bunch of weird haircuts, but like this is how I will always remember him with the Jean Baptiste Emmanuel Zork haircut. That's weird. I haven't seen him in months. I don't know. Maybe he has it again. I don't know what he's doing. Funny. Maybe he has other famous sci-fi haircuts. Maybe he could have Gary Oldman's hair from Dracula from all, for all I know. <laughs> Just an assortment of get ga- and he vaguely looks like Gary Oldman, very, very vaguely, but enough to where I'm watching Zork and I'm like, yeah, this is just Dustin, the the space villain. <laughs> That's funny. Good stuff. Yeah. So Zorg was an interesting character for me. I mm-hmm. he, he is the closest thing, I think, in the film to that, like, greedy capitalist character that you see in a, 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 a lot of sci-fi films. Like, I am mm-hmm. the CEO of a major co- co- corporation yeah. and stuff like that. But again, this film doesn't really dive into that all that much. No. Yeah. Um, but he is kind of like this war monger, just like, I'm going to buy a bunch of weapons and sell a bunch of weapons. And like, he's almost like an evil version of t- Tony Stark. But yeah, he's there is a nice <laughs> scene where he's talking about the benefit of what he does. And he points to this like glass of water on his desk. Mm-hmm. He's like, look at that glass of water. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. Nothing's happening. And he's like, now if I knock off the glass of water and like the glass falls to the ground. It smashes. There's water spilled everywhere. All these tiny little robots come out from like a door in his office and they all show up and like one's vacuuming up the water and like one's sweeping and like one's bringing him a new glass of water. And he's like, now do you see how much activity there is after you destroy something? Like he's got a strategy in mind. Like he did in his own way. He's like, no, this is good for the world. <laughs> it, it's business. It's activity. It's something to do for people. The piece is boring. Yeah. Yeah. That that's yeah. That, I mean, that I think is a, it's, it's <laughs> something you see in like war m- movies as, as well. Just like that, that character who's all about like, Hey, it actually makes a lot of money to c- cause chaos and 
dis- destruction and stuff mm. like that. You were laughing at something. It looked, looked like you were an- about to say something. <laughs> There's later on in that scene. Uh, so like he's got this desk with like all these buttons he can press and like he pressed mm-hmm. the you know the button and like all those robots came out to take care of the glass of water. Like, he like hits a button and like a bowl of fruit pops up from his desk and it's got like an electronic robot voice with it. it says bowl of fruit and then he takes a <laughs> cherry off the bowl and the voice says one cherry. <laughs> like it, it narrates what he's doing and he eats the cherry and he's choking on the pit and then. And he's like gesturing for Ian Holm to come over there and like t- hit him on the back. And Ian Holm's just like laugh, just like watching him suffer, just like all of your power, everything you can do. And look how felled you are by a single cherry. And like he's hitting all <laughs> the buttons on his desk and it's pulling up like all these other gadgets and all these other weird act, you know, activities. And then like a pet opens up, like this little cute elephant pet animal yeah. just like rises up from the desk like it lives in there and it's just looking at him it's like oh hi like it doesn't know what's happening you Jerry know what it's like my back my back you know what he, he kind of reminds me of in an odd way the like president or I, I i don't remember if he was a president but uh that one mel brooks role in space balls yes yes where he's um, like I, I just think of the the absurdity of it, all of the stuff that he has there. Name, President Scroob. Yeah, something like that, and just that scene yeah. where he p- pulls out the can of of air. You know, yes. Like, the, the the absurdity of all of that stuff is is kind of what his character reminds me of. Um. Yeah, I mean, he he just he's li- he's more like a caricature than he is meant to be, like a warning of. This yeah, stuff. <laughs> I just love that when you look up this movie on IMDb, Mel Brooks is listed as President Scroob slash yogurt. <laughs> God, I forgot about yogurt. Yeah, Master Yogurt. Spaceball, it's the flamethrower. The kids love that one. <laughs> God, I remembered him, but I forgot that yogurt was his name. <laughs> yep, as what, well as what Pizza a the film. Hut. Oh, you, I can never forget about Pizza the Hut. He's with me at all times. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I I I, I liked his character a mm. lot. He was fun to watch. Um, yeah, very iridescent. I loved yeah. his shiny clothes. Indeed. I I think the one that the the the, the two that are kind of, kind of exactly what I expected. Uh, was Bruce Willis's character as well as Chris Tucker's character? <laughs> just from all the gifts I've seen, like that was just exactly what I expected. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I think the combination of like I to to be honest, I found Ruby Ruby Rod is 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 his name is yes. Chris T- Tucker's character i found him to be really uh, really annoying but it's, is it, it, it he's an interesting foil to yes yes bruce willis is like overly macho but very stoic like <laughs> almost bland masculinity right that's just bruce willis and everything i mean yeah that's the setting much, he but, comes at but like it's i, I, I would say in uh God, why am I blanking on the film's name? We just mentioned it. Uh, uh, the Die Hard. One. Yeah, Die, 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 <laughs> the die Hard. The action one. <laughs> the action one that he's in, you know, that the action film with Bruce Willis. I do have to say that if you just waved your hand at me and were like, you know, that film, the action one, it probably would only take me like four or five tries to get to yeah, die, die Hard. Yeah. Um, no, in in Die Hard, like he, he is the every a cop but i feel like he's more charming in that like he is more of a likable character and in mm. this he, he's more just like he's he's not like paper thin like he's not just a piece of cardboard but he's still just like it's a fucking wet noodle like it, it, there's not much to him and that's what chris t- 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 tucker yeah. just hates it's like just say something more than one word <laughs> like <laughs> 
because the character of Ruby Rod is also a performer in himself. He's like a radio DJ, this like amazing star TV radio show, DJ, radio host. Yeah, yeah, like, and like he's w- always walking around with like a, a headset mic. Like he's always talking about what he's doing, like for this radio show. Performer. And he's and Corbin Dallas has won this prize to go to this uh, the resort that Ruby Rod is promoting. And he's expecting, like, oh, I'm going to have the the prize winner, a special guest on my show. How exciting it'll be to talk to this person who won this award, mm-hmm. won this prize. And then Corbin's just like, yeah, good to be here. You're okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, are you having fun? He's just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's, okay. he's so okay. upset. <laughs> he's so Anything upset else? that this guy <laughs> isn't matching his energy. But his energy... I I don't know how Chris Tucker did this. You know those YouTube videos where it's like B movie, but every time they say B, the film speeds up fifty percent. It's like somebody applied that to only Chris Tucker in this movie. He is just, like he keeps getting faster, and everybody else stays the same speed. Like you've heard the saying "mile a minute." This is like sixty miles a minute. I don't know why they didn't hire him to be the new Micro Machines guy. <laughs> <laughs> Ruby Rod here for Micro Machines. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, like it's just, like that is another one of those contradictions, right? Like you have mm-hmm. the the like uber macho masculine role of I, Corbin. I mean, and I, and I want to say da- like da- Dallas Cor- Corbin isn't. You keep describing him as this like ultra masculine, and I guess he is only by benefit of he's Bruce Willis. Like the performance well, is really understated. Like he is not trying right. to be cool. He's not posing. He's not posturing. He's not a man's he's man. Like, yeah, like he just naturally is that. Like there's nothing different he's doing in his performance, he's- and the character is actually, oh, like I kind of like Corbin. I like that when Lilu shows up. I appreciate Lilu to begin with. I like that the the movie agrees. <laughs> 100 out of 100 cast members agree. Lilu, very attractive. But yes. the movie also goes to a lot of lengths to say she's not just visually appealing. She's uh, emotionally endearing. Like people don't just like to look at Lilu. People also like Lilu. And mm-hmm. Corbin feels this. Like when as soon as she shows up, like he's not just lusting after her like he's really smitten with her like he likes all of her and he's kind of a puppy dog about her and that i liked a lot yeah so what 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 i was about to say that is he though he he is the like over masculine character by himself he's just again he's just kind of normal he's not he he is not the action star he is not Mm. that like he hasn't been he has not been elevated to that like ober status he's kind of thrust in that role by circumstances as well as in comparison to chris tucker's character who is this like just ultra flamboyant non-masculine very like almost androgynous but just very queer like signaling if that if that's the right the right word and yeah just like, yeah those two together like end up being this like yin and yang of just complete op- op- opposites right which then makes bruce willis look a lot more masculine than he already is i will uh, say about ruby rod that he's a ladies man He's flirting oh, yeah. with every lady. He's like he's just having sex with one of the stewardesses yeah. on his space plane, and to have Eating that out in the middle of the f- of the f- 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 light and stuff, and yeah, yeah, and to have that come with the way he dresses and the way he styles his hair and the way he's literally wearing lipstick at one point. Like you don't normally see those things put together inside one person, but with Ruby Rod, you do. He's a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. And it's just it's 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 interesting to see that combination because in a standard action film you wouldn't really see that, right? Mm. Or like he he might be a side character, but you wouldn't really see him as like the like right hand man if if that like he's almost at the like sidekick 
in that in that like last half of the film there approximately yeah like he's just around like they just need to use his ship to get to this place like he's just this peripheral character who's just on like a parallel journey to these people (laughs) like he's he's not protagonist or antagonist or sidekick or anything he's just around and yelling for a while (laughs) until you get to this final big battle at the opera house and then he's like, okay, if I need to survive, then I'm with you, I guess. And it's only then that he falls into the sidekick role. Yeah. He's like, great, now I got to figure out how to activate this ancient pillar. <laughs> I don't have any fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he's an, an interesting character for sure. Mm-hmm. Let's jump to Lilu because you started to talk about her some too. Yeah, I mean, I like... Mila Jojovich. I, I, I haven't really seen her in much besides the Resident Evil films, which aren't all that g- great. But I still mm. like her in in those films, um, or at least like the first c- 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 couple of them because they've made like eight of them. I think I don't know. <sighs> God. Um, but yeah i i thought she was an interesting character i see here in wikipedia when t- talking about the themes of this film that luc Besson himself said he didn't really intend this movie to have themes like he's like it's <laughs> not a big theme movie You're right. um, that makes sense yeah the movie is like showing you a lot of things but it doesn't seem like it is very much to say but at the same time a lot of p- people have kind of noted like there's not very many women in this film and when they when they they are in there they're just c- kind of background objects and they're just set dressing for the most p- part mm. the main exception i g- guess would would be lilu's character who is again just like i i, I to me, I feel like a weird c- contradiction of things because she almost is the action star of this film, which is strange yeah. because you also have Bruce Willis in this, who is the action star in this film too, right? You know, uh, and because she she has this one moment where I I think it's on the plane or in like in that little bunk, and she's just like, "I will protect you." He's just like, "Wait." No, I'm mm-hmm. I'm protect. What? No, <laughs> you know. But she believes that because we've seen her fight, and she she knows mm. how to do all of that stu- stuff. You know, um, and then she there's that scene where she sees all the like American kung fu and martial arts and stuff like that. She's like, "Ooh, I like this." <laughs> <laughs> She's going through this. Like, she like wakes up after being just like a bone for a while. She's reconstituted into being a human being. I love that. Yeah, and she does have this like when you're a b- 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 bone for a long time, and you just wake <laughs> up. You know, you know. Great yeah, you human. gotta know. You gotta know things again. So she's going through this like Encarta encyclopedia program. It's just flashing through letters. <laughs> and it's like she thinks she, she gets hurt and she thinks she's about to die. And she's like, I only got to V. And Bruce Willis is like, Yeah, it's a, lot, a lot of good stuff in V. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but I mean, like she, uh, again, you mentioned that she is like. Uh, everyone basically says it's like oh she's really attractive mm. uh, and and at the same time like she's sexualized at uh, to an extent but not in a way that i feel like other characters were in this film like the yeah. flight att- 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 attendance yeah. or stuff like that like she had enough of this uh like action star badass vibe that they kind of knew not to mess with her uh if, if that makes sense I, yeah and like, like she's so far distance she's resilient but she's not i would say tough she's not cool she's not she does badass things but she herself is not badass you know like she's very sweet and open Right. And in, yeah. in, she just also happens to know uh, many advanced fighting skills and could kill pretty much anybody with only her bare hands. But yeah. she's just sort of bubbly, 
most of the time when she's not in peril. Oh, and I liked. No, go ahead. The thing that I was just gonna say is like, yeah, the innocent kind of bubbly mm. mindset, or the the way she, you know, her she, the the way her mannerisms are and stuff like that. That's also usually seen on a character that is more sexualized. Just like, oh, she's this sweet innocent thing, you know, and then, and then some creepy man comes along. It's like I. I want some of that, you know. Uh, mm. But yeah, like they they don't really do that. They do to an extent, but uh, there, there's also do. this reverence for her. I think. Yes, you're right. Yeah, like the when they first reconstitute her out of being a bone, like there is a sleazy <laughs> space journal who's like, I need to take pictures of this for the records, and like the scientist who rebuilt her's like, look at her. She's perfect. But everything she continues to do, he's like, she's perfect. And like the, the he says it like three times. And at the end, you can tell he doesn't just mean like, ah, oh, what a physical specimen. He's like, look at her go. Look what she can do yeah. beyond just look at how she looks. He's yeah. like amazed to see her like jump up and fight somebody. Yeah, you're right. And she has she repeatedly like every time she needs to change clothes like her clothes get dirty after a fight or something she just pulls them off right there yeah Yeah, like she doesn't say anything and all the other characters do like turn away from her and they're like she she is perfect but there isn't the moment where they're like no no i'll watch right like it's not great but there is an opportunity there that they did ignore which it could have been creepier and it wasn't, which mm-hmm. feels weird to compliment it saying it could have been creepier and it wasn't. Yeah. But yeah, like they do what is, uh, you know, if given the situation in the film, they do what they're supposed to do. They turn around and they're like, oh, okay, okay, this is awkward uh, for us. We don't know what to do with this. Yeah. So <laughs> the the next thing I noticed about her, or, well, I guess mm. we should back up and also say that she, like her character is the fifth element uh, it's her whatever that may be yeah and um, she's like the embodiment of love too like it's not just her it's like corbin's love for her and their love for each other so that's, love is the fifth element much like as captain planet taught us <laughs> right and heart um mm-hmm. so like that's also one thing that i saw kind of criticized about mm. this film is that like she is this uh, the, the, you know this specimen that it has power, and she she mm. can save the world, but she can't really do that unless a man confesses her love for her, and so it kind of takes away this power that like oh she still needs a man to do this, and even though he might not you know be the one that is at the end of the day saving the world, it's mm. actually her, but you know like from a more feminist perspective like I, it, it probably would have served the film to just have her be able to do that on her own and she's just kind of using him to <laughs> it's like hey you're a taxi driver <laughs> all i need is a ride i do i appreciate that at the end of this wacky over the top sci-fi action film like the answer at the end of the day is love the, the, yeah, sure. like, water I, fire earth air love love is the last element i get that and like yeah, she, yeah. that that I, she, I think is a good thing like it's something, mm. something that i because i when i first saw all those hieroglyphics and that fifth one in the middle was human shaped uh and then they made Lilu. And she was humanoid, right? Mm. I was like, oh, maybe the fifth element is the human element. I got it. <laughs> and then as the movie went on, it's no, it's love. Uh, that's how you save the world. You save it with love. Mm-hmm. I, I like the climax of the movie as an echo point to something that happened earlier. 
after like Lulu's been through like this huge fight the, after she like jumps off the building and like lands in Corbin's cab and they go through all this this whole ordeal and she's like take me to this priest and he takes her to Ian Holm she's passed out she's completely asleep and Ian Holm's like okay I, I need to talk to her you need to wake her up but like be gentle about her like this is the savior of all humanity yeah. so Corbin's trying to like jostle her and he goes in for like the sleeping uh, beauty snow white kiss <laughs> and there's even a look on his face like I don't know, it might work. Like he, he's doubting right. himself when he goes in to try it. And then it works, I suppose. She wakes up and she says this phrase to him in her alien language. She's very upset. And then later when he's about to leave, he turns to Ian Holm and he's like, well, what did that phrase mean? And, he, and Ian Holm says, not without my permission. He says, oh, yeah. And he's like, he really sincerely regrets kissing her while she's asleep. Not just as, oh, I like this girl. Now she's upset with me. I've ruined my chance. It's like, yeah. no, that was the wrong thing to do to her. I yeah. should not have. And like, he says it again later. Like he says it in that scene. And then the next time we see him, he's it's like driving his cab her. home. He's like, he, he has like one more moment. Like he's still thinking about it. And I, appreciated that the movie had a character make that mistake and then truly like recognize what was wrong, regret mm -hmm. it and like try and do better about it. And I like that we have this fairy tale thing of no, you don't just give her the snow white sleeping beauty kiss. That's not how this works. But at the end of the movie, when he's like the, both of them are like fully open and engaged with each other. And they're having this like mutual discussion about love love is the saving element there. Yeah. Like all these, this goofy fairy tale stuff can be real and can be potent. If you meet each other at equal ground and like you're sincere and open and honest about it. Indeed. Yeah. I, I think to kind of play an opposite perspective of that is, yeah, it mm. does kind of flip the normal g gender roles the hair that like yeah she is still the the action star she is the one that will save yeah. the planet and the guy can be there too and he can still be an, an action star but he's just basically there to support her and be the love interest for her but mm -hmm. it's also a weird thing because the movie is filmed following bruce willis's character most of the time so it's because it's, it's, he's like a whole guy and Lee who is not an entire person yet yeah it's yeah like, it, it's a weird mix of things it's like well it's this but it's also this and it's this and it's also that it's these strange contradictions within the film mm. that I, I i think ends up making it something worth while yeah, yeah. Yeah, and let's talk about the visuals for a bit. What were some of your favorite visual elements of this movie? Uh, t t to me, I think, <laughs> I think the aliens at the start because they don't really come back again. They say they are, and then I think, do we see them again at the end? I don't remember. I, th I think so, but like it's not exactly the same form, or we don't see as many of them. Like the real showpiece is at the beginning with Luke yeah. Perry and that pyramid. They are such a clunky design. Oh, but in a great way. Like they're purposefully clunky. It's it, yeah, like it's not what you would expect from like in yeah I I alien or some kind of like robot thing. It is mm. just. The most gaudy thing. It is big. It is pointy and spiky and round. And there's like jewels adorning it. It seems like it, it's just it's such an odd design. But it's that's kind of what I expect from Mobius. Of just like that. That looks like his artwork. That looks like something he would make. And I was just like, I like this. This is really cool. Um. But at the same t t t t time, yeah, it's like, I also kind of thought those were the ugliest things in the whole movie. Like, they're so ugly. I love them. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the costumes. Mm -hmm. I love what an orange movie this is. Oh, yeah. Like, lilu has got her orange hair, and she's wearing, like, a the o weird plastic orange suspenders later in the movie. Bruce Willis looks great in that orange tank top. That's why I wore one today. I'm hoping to get yeah. that good Willis style. I, I, I wish <laughs> that would Willis come style. into fashion. Na, 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 I, na, na. 
I wish that be. I wish that became just like a standard uh, item in menswear. Just like just, I, just the the Corbin Dallas tank top there's, with the vertical bands on the back of it. There's some people that can pull stuff like that off. I I I will be the first to, to, to say I am not one of them. Mm. I would never be able to pull something like that that that, 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 that off. But but yeah, the the passion in this I, I think is just it's beautiful to mm-hmm. look at. Um, I like the uh the flossed in paradise that resort they go to at the end has a lot of really yeah. classic architecture. Like it looks like just a regular beautiful high class hotel in a beautiful high class opera house. That was something I took note of and the thing that stood out to me is mm. the more like Hawaiian and Samoan cultures that were there, which is not something you typically see in sci-fi stuff. And I was like, yeah, I like that. Like, let's get some more like, uh, like island Pacific, Pacific Islander flavor in sci-fi. That that would be neat. Yeah, and it's another echo of like the McDonald's thing. Like, no matter how far in the future you get, and how dramatically some things have changed. You may still like to take right? a trip somewhere, and there's a, a cultural representative there to put a, a wreath of flowers around your neck. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to our people. Welcome yeah. to our land. Namaste. Enjoy your stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that was neat. I I really enjo- enjoyed that. And uh, again, it's just like like we've been saying with these contradictions. We see these like older styles of architecture and cu- culture. Mm. We get in uh, opera. But then it's yeah. being sung by this alien in the, like, like the most Star Wars looking thing, yes. I think, in this oh, whole absolutely. film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she just looks like a, a cousin of a Twi'lek or something like that. Yeah. Very, like, s- strong, 100% on the sci fi scale <laughs> that it comes this lady to do this absolutely classical opera singing like there's no twist to it like the sound of it is completely conventional just coming out of uh, uh, this magical space woman and then i like how they they wrap that up with the lilu fighting those bad guys in the hotel room and like the opera like it's a very conventional opera and then she sort of stops and does like a second song that is more like a beat opera and she's Mm -hmm. like dancing around (laughs) she's got these jerky like contemporary hip-hop dance moves to go with her opera and then as that gets a higher tempo and gets more rhythmic the action scene is mirroring that yeah yeah it's it's i yeah it it just has some beautiful things to look at Mm. and i mentioned the flying cars look neat yeah too that 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 was fun to see all of oh, those things. One of the best things in the movie. There's that m- man who in his boat restaurant who just flies up to Corbin's window. <laughs> it's yeah. like you order DoorDash, but the DoorDash is like an entire hibachi, and it flies up next right. to your window, and it's like, okay, uh, I'm ready to cook for you. What do you want? And you, this person cooks for you, and you share a meal together. You talk, and then he flies away to some other hungry person. So I. I yeah, like stuff like that, the cop cars. I think the one that stood out to me the most was his taxi. Because, mm-hmm. uh, again, it's a flying car, so it's futuristic. But then it has, it's this like hybrid design of like a, f- a sleek, futuristic flying car with a more classic, uh, or not, not classic p- p- per se, but this like older style car that you might have yeah. seen like... Maybe more back in the like forties or thirties. It looks or like the cartoon cab from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but it flies. Yeah, like it's it's almost that like uh, Batman the animated series style of stuff where yes, it, yes. it looks more yeah like nineteen twenties nineteen thirties, but they also don't tell you what time it is. It takes place in so they do have other like futuristic gadgets and stuff and that's what this looks like and i like that kind of strange mishmash of stuff that makes it seem timeless 
and like everything talks, but it talks in this like very stilted robot voice. Like nothing mm-hmm. sounds like Siri yet. Like I, one detail I really liked is that Corbin's trying to quit smoking and he's yeah. got this little device on his wall. That's like four cigarettes and like these little glass tubes. And he like breaks one out, like when he needs it and he's, he's limiting himself to only four a day. And it has this reader board, electronic reader board sign that says, I commit to quit only four a day. And like, there's a robot voice that says this, like my goal is to quit smoking. Hmm. <laughs> I like that is a, a physical piece, like an appliance he has screwed onto his wall and it talks to him. And we felt, we've thought that f- far into the future, but it still sounds like the voice of a calculator. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it's not a woman's voice. That's a, a several degrees removed robot woman. <laughs> also the cigarettes in this movie were like 70% filter. I don't know why the cigarettes look different. I couldn't see the purpose behind that. But yeah, those are futuristic, I guess, as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Here's a fun fact kind of about this film that I'm just writing right now. Um, Apparently, Alejandro uh, Jodorowsky, I don't know how to say his last name. Jodorowsky! Yodorowsky, there we go, uh, and Jean Gerard, a.k.a. Mobius, sued Luc Besson after the film was released, claiming that the fifth element had plagiarized their comic, The Incall. Uh, Gerard sued mm-hmm. for 13.1 million euros for unfair compensation, 9 million euros in damages and in interest and two to five percent of the net operating revenues of the film uh jodorowsky sued for seven hundred thousand euros the case was dismissed in 2004 on the grounds of only tiny fragments of the comic had been used and also because Gerard had been hired by Besson to work on the film before the allegations were made. Mm-hmm. Interesting thing that he worked on the film and then like sued was like, you stole my comic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know Yodorowsky even made a comic. Huh? Oh yeah. He, um, they, they have a series of sci-fi books. It's him and Mobius. I've, I started to read one of them before realizing that it, that was like the fourth or fifth one in this series. And I was like, I need to go back and read the other elements first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can't start at five. But yeah, it's called The Incall. Okay. Yeah, I don't know anything about Yodorowsky except for the Holy Mountain and his attempt to make Dune. Interesting. Okay. Maybe we'll have to read the in call or something on mm. the show at some point. But there you go. So that that's about it though. I, I I don't know if I have much else to say about this film. But yeah, like my initial reaction to this thing was wasn't as good as everyone said it was. It's kind of <laughs> it's boring. It's it is a feast for your eyes when it is operating at that level when it wants to impress you it impresses you but then there are a lot of other scenes where it's like oh we're just still in this military boardroom where everybody's wearing just slightly futuristic clothes we're still talking that stuff i don't mind all that much in Mm. (laughs) sci-fi films but yeah just at the end of the day it was just like very very basic plot like not there, there you know there's no twists there's no uh it's just like very standard action stuff and so beyond that i was just like it's kind of boring but yeah like once you once you think back on the film and i think take a second look there are some interesting things to talk about uh which i think at the end of the day made me like the film but i can see why people would also not like this film as yeah apparently looking at the reception of the film there's a lot of people who are like this film is bad <laughs> this film is not good <laughs> i i understand and i think it is a an appropriate level as a cult hit i think it yeah. really really works on some exactly. people and would be utterly off-putting to other people exactly exactly uh apparently 
uh, asked in an interview in 2014 if he liked the film. Gary Oldman stated, "Oh no, I can't bear it." <laughs> yeah, this despite the fact that he's in it, this doesn't seem like a movie Gary Oldman would watch in his personal right. life. I don't know what he watches. <laughs> Maybe he I mean, just watches that footage book, of birds, yeah. like just right? other forms of art that we don't get. <laughs> he watches his own reflection as Who he knows? stares at himself in the mirror without blinking. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but I think that's about it. I have to say on the film. Do you have recommendations for people who might like this film? Uh. W- Two years ago, when we first started the podcast, we did an episode on Luc Besson's later film, Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets. Mm-hmm. Which and is I also think that, one of the inspirations for this film. So Yeah, yeah, that is based on uh, some French comics that preceded the fifth element, made the fifth element, and then later he got the rights to make a movie based on those comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, that movie, I think, is similar to the fifth element in that it looks very good. And there are some sequences that are thrilling, and there are other sequences that are boring people in boardrooms. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's a guy with his jacket buttoned all the way up to his neck, just just giving commands to some people. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I think that's worth watching. That movie didn't do well. I don't think it is well regarded. But watch it for the visuals. I think it's worth the visual time you spend with it. You know, if mm-hmm. not for your mind, do it for your eyes. There you Give go. your eyes a treat that the rest of your body and mind and soul doesn't have to worry about. Uh, and I would also recommend, of course, Futurama. <laughs> if Good you one. need yeah. more like flying cars and just like kind of everyday schlubby people and like a, a <laughs> lady in a white tank top beating people up. Futurama is there for you. <laughs> it is. That is a good one indeed. Uh, let's see. I I think I want to recommend uh there's a comic called Black Science uh mm. by Rick Remender and I am blanking on the artist's name. Let me see. Artist name is Matteo Scalera. And it's kind of a dimension hopping sci fi mm. e- 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 epic. Uh, the art is fantastic in in this book. I highly re- recommend checking it out um, for you guys of, out, out there. But um, yeah, they he he's a scientist. <laughs> he's a scientist, and he discovers how to uh, hop into different dimensions, and he uses that technology to then like okay how do we cure cancer how do we get the like newer technology and stuff like that and it's kind of like a fantastic four kind of thing as well of like the whole family goes to these different dimensions and then things go wrong and there's murder and there's all sorts of stuff like that so they have to um fix what they did as well as they all get separated and they have to find one another and stuff like that. So it's this big like intergalactic uh dimension hopping let's go save the world type of thing with some great artwork. I would Neat. recommend that one. Um and let's see if I had another thing. Do I have a second thing? You know what? <laughs> go watch Star Wars Clone Wars. Good, yeah. I think that's a good one if you if you liked this too. It has the right amount of of comedy, of action, of just heartfelt emotional moments, and some great characters and aliens, mm-hmm. stuff like that too. So, good stuff. Um, Melissa, yes. Next week here on the show, yes. You and I are doing our end of the month special. Uh, we are mm-hmm. going to be covering the first four volumes of a comic called Irredeemable. Um, and I I really, really love that comic. I, I have been wanting to pitch this on the show for a long time. But kind of the, the only way to have done this story is if we did it in its entirety. Uh, yeah. So that is what we are going to be doing. Uh, yeah, I will say being... Uh... Three months. <laughs> 
Being a volume and a half into it, this would not have been satisfying to only read one yes. week's worth of. <laughs> I no. am excited to see how the entirety of this thing goes. Part of what makes this story special is how this whole the the whole irredeemable comic ends. Ooh, and yeah, that that's that's that that ending makes it worth it. Um, but that is what we will be covering it is a comic book by mark wade and i do not remember uh who does the art off the top of my head um let's see Me either Oops. Oh, does the artwork on this uh peter K kraus okay does the artwork on that mark wade and peter Kraus. Long story short, uh, this is about the world's greatest superhero he going bad. He mm -hmm. did something, and he snapped, uh, and he went bad, and now everyone else is trying to figure out why. What happened exactly that caused him to do this thing? And that's kind of the whole mystery um, mm. be 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 behind this thing. So, uh, he, And he's so omnipotent he's so mm -hmm. incredibly powerful that like everybody on earth is like terrified and like just running scared because they're like we have no idea what could remotely damage this man yeah. we've never been prepared for this yeah imagine superman if he was overpowered and didn't have kryptonite mm -hmm. well, that would be yes he, he went bad so that's the whole thing i i'm excited to talk about this next week we're going to be discussing the first four v volumes there's 10 total mm. um, so we, we will be covering this for the next three months here um but after that Alyssa, we will be getting into october and that is when we normally do uh like horror movies and comics and tv shows and stuff like that so did you want to go ahead and pitch yes. the first horror series that we will be covering in october yeah, so welcome to Spooky Month, Kyle. Spoopy. So since <laughs> since we've got two weeks until we'll be recording this episode, I went with three spooky TV shows since we'll have okay. a little bit more time to watch them. Pitch number one is, I think, the quickest turnaround from you denying something I've pitched you to me trying to repitch it to you. Okay. I think I tried to get you to watch this maybe two months ago. <laughs> it is the TV series that. Hannibal. This okay. is... Yeah, from showrunner Brian Fuller, whose work we've seen before on Pushing Daisies and yeah. American Gods. He's worked on uh, what did he, other things, other big things. Good old I was, other I was things. Trying, I was going to name other popular shows, and I'm like, Wonder Falls. I'm like, listen, nobody remembers Wonder Falls. <laughs> like, you already named Anyways, the two most Wonder recognizable. <laughs> I think you already named the two most recognizable things he did, and this is the third one. Stuff, yeah, uh, things, Lori. Mm. <laughs> uh, Hannibal is a prequel series about Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. More specifically, it is about a criminal profiler named Will Graham, who I believe, if I remember correctly, has some sort of an, an empathy condition where he can empathize very, very strongly with people. And that includes somebody who may have been a murderer. Like he uses this to kind of get into the murderer's heads. And his job is incredibly stressful. And so Dr. Hannibal Lecter is the psychiatrist he goes mm. to see. And great doctor. Dr. Lecter, yeah, and Dr. Lecter kind of helps walk him through his cases and tries well, to hide the fact you? that... <laughs> Except it's Mads Mikkelsen, so it's a very serious Danish accent. Mads is good, though. He's he's also he's, a great actor. He's so great in this show. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne is in it. He plays like the head of this law enforcement team. One of the major conflicts of the show is that he can tell every case he puts Will Graham on is severely getting to this guy. And there's the issue of, do I have to maybe let a murderer run free because I can't put my best guy on the case because this will kill him. <laughs> like he can't take any more of this. Yeah. There's the struggle of how many more cases can I put you on before you just break before yeah. we don't have you at all. It's a murder mystery show. 
uh, with the threat of Hannibal Lecter lurking in the background. Really interesting case of the week murderers and this beautiful visual style. The show is so like lushly gothic. It's all in like rich jewel tones mm -hmm. and dusky charcoals. The cinematography is beautiful. The music's beautiful. There's all these lovely artistic scenes of Dr. Lecter preparing a meal. All the episodes are named after like fancy French cuisine. This is a very, this is a show I watched the first season of a couple years ago when it first aired, which I think might have been 2014 thereabouts. And I never continued it because it was a little too dark for me. But I'm, rem I have, think back very fondly on the style of the show. Gotcha. And I know you're a crime guy. So yes. this would be particularly fun to revisit with you and see how you find it. Indeed. I've uh, heard nothing but good things, especially about season one of this show. Mm. I don't remember how people reacted to the rest of it. But uh, yeah, I have, I have heard nothing but good things about this show. So that's pitch number one. Yep. Hannibal. That's 10 episodes and that's on Netflix. Okay. Pitch number two, uh, this is a comedy show. I'm going to give you a comedy break here in between two dramas. This is a comedy called Stan Against Evil. Have you heard of this? I've heard the name. <clears throat> this is a comedy show from the uh, last couple years. I think this might have premiered in like 2016. And this is about a man who is the sheriff of a small town. Mm -hmm. And his wife dies and he retires. And then he learns that his wife had been almost like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer figure. Oh, okay. <laughs> like his wife had been fighting all of these supernatural problems in town. And they're in like this little New England town that had like witch trial murders happening sure, yeah. however many hundreds of years ago. So it's like there's 172 demons that the run amok in this town and my wife died and now I have to figure out how to she stop them. She was the only, only one... Yeah. Keeping them at bay. Me and the, the new lady sheriff that I disagree with because I'm a grumpy old man. The new lady sheriff played by Avatar Cora. Janet oh. Varney. It's, like, it's interesting. We were talking about we were making Avatar references the whole night. It's like, well, here she is. We have an Avatar in our pitches this week. There you go. This show is from Dana Gould, who is uh, a guy who wrote on The Simpsons for a while. I've heard so that name. Kind of, yeah. He's a, a comedy writer at large. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard from Dana Gould somewhere. He's also sure, a yeah, prevalent yeah. podcaster and podcast guest. So this is just a very goofy, campy, absurd monster of the week show. I Hold on. Let me read you one of the episode descriptions so you get a sense of what you're in store for. Sure. I took screenshots of this earlier. Okay. Stan's daughter Denise goes blueberry picking and comes home with a pet goat that turns out to be the Baphomet, an ancient ghost -based, goat based demon who wants both Stan and Denise dead. Well, because somebody wanted blueberries. Like, it's just really <laughs> absurd okay. problems like that. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. I've, yeah. Pitch number three we're circling back to a drama. And we are also circling back to showrunners we have worked with before. Okay. By worked with, I mean we watched a thing they did and then talked about it. <laughs> this is also a property we've talked about before. Pitch number three is Dracula, the three-episode miniseries from the creators of Sherlock. We wow. talked about Sherlock as our first episode of this year, and we watched... Is previously mentioned Gary Oldman starring in Bram Stoker's Dracula last year. Okay. I don't know much about this. Uh, it's from Gaddis and Moffat, I think the two Sherlock creators. This is formatted like Sherlock. It's three episodes that are an hour and a half long each. And the little Netflix. Made this. Yeah, and the little Netflix blurb just says. The Count Dracula legend transforms with new tales that flesh out the vampire's gory crimes and bring his vulnerability into the light. I watched the little Netflix trailer for it. It didn't give me very much. It just seems like this is Dracula. We're going to talk to the people in Dracula's life. We're going to get to know Dracula. We're going to get into his backstory and find out not just what he does, but why. Why does Dracula sure, yeah. Dracula? I don't know why much about this. 
<laughs> I don't know much about this, but with the Sherlock pedigree behind it, I'm intrigued to see that's an interesting one. What yeah. those guys do with another famous literary character. Okay. Yep. Those yeah, are good so pitch pitches. Number, yep. Pitch number one is Hannibal, and then Stand Against Evil, and then Dracula. Oh, and that's also on Netflix, and Stand Against Evil is on Hulu. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, hmm. I think I am going to go with Hannibal. About dang time, Kyle. I was going to keep pitching this at you until you eventually picked it. I felt like if I didn't pick it, which, I look, the Dracula thing is a good runner up there. I think they're they're all good, but that one, I think, would have been my next pick. Um, But, yeah, let's go with Hannibal. Yeah, I think this is a, a show you will dig. I think this is well regarded as a crime very interesting, specific grisly murders. Yeah, kind of why I picked it because I'm a big yeah. crime show fan. But I know that like also this whole story about Hannibal Lecter and all that stuff. Like that's often considered like great horror film. Like the whole Silence of the Lambs L- L- mm-hmm. thing. And what was the sequel that they made? That one or uh, I don't remember. Is it Red Dragon. Yes, that. I don't know for I know it was made after Silence of the Lambs, but I got to tell you, I don't know how the timeline shakes out. That might have been a prequel. I don't know. Maybe I can't speak to it. Um but yeah, like I I know that just the idea of Hannibal to a lot of people is really creepy and scary and ugh. yeah, so let's let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> stuff so uh just to recap next week first four volumes of irredeemable the following week will be season one of hannibal yep indeed melissa where can the people find you on the internet you can find me on twitter and instagram at wilkywit that's w-i-l-k-y-w-i-t you can find me at yo kyle springer on twitter and instagram you guys want to stay up to date uh, with our podcasts? We are at the Whatnots on Twitter. Go like, share, subscribe. Especially subscribe to us on YouTube. I think mm-hmm. we are at eighty-seven subscribers right now. Oh boy! Uh, so we're we're inching ever close. Uh, and Think I, small. I yes, we'll keep mentioning this until we get to <laughs> one hundred. So if you guys want to shut me up. So that I don't mention this ever again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's get us to 100 so that we can get that vanity URL and Ooh. stuff like that. Or I think that's how it works. But yeah. Um, yeah. Once we get there, that would be great. So help us spread the word. Uh, we would ap- appreciate that t- tons. Uh, but... I guess that wraps us up here for episode 124 of the Whatnots Review Show. We will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.